Welcome to the Brandstand Woodwind Shop. This is the third video on restoring this old distant coronet. This coronet is about 130 years old, possibly even older. On really old instruments, it is very common for metal to crack and solder joints to break. Whenever I work on an antique instrument, I always check for cracks, knowing that there probably will be some. I carefully looked through all of the parts. These parts are okay. They do have some dents in them, but they are not cracked. On the body of the coronet, I only found one crack, and that is right there. It is tight, and I checked it. It does not leak, so I'm going to leave that one. If it did leak, or if it was causing a problem on the instrument, I would fix it. But since it is not leaking and not causing any problems, I'm going to leave it. I did find two broken solder joints on the coronet. There is one right there, that solder joint between the water key bridge and the brace right there. It is hard to see if you're just looking at it, but if you take the slide and flex it just a little bit, you can see it moving. And the other broken solder joint is right there. As I was carefully looking over the coronet, I did notice that the bell and the lead pipe had been removed sometime in the past, probably a very long time ago. The way I know that is there are four solder joints holding on the bell and you can see right there there's a little bit of tarnish it is not tarnish on the silver plating but where the solder was and the silver polish did not clean up the solder and on all four of the solder joints that hold the bell on they are all the same way so I know that this bell had been removed sometime in the past on the lead pipe it's the same thing on this solder joint right here between those two tubes it's hard to tell but you can tell that it was soldered because there is not silver plating over it if this was a solder joint that had been done at the factory then there would be silver plating over the solder but there is not and also right here you can see that this joint came off at one time. So all four of these solder joints had been removed on the lead pipe and all four of the solder joints on the bell had been removed. Another thing I noticed is part of this brace had been replaced. Not all of the brace but just part of it. See how the flanges are decorated with a beaded edge right there and also right there? Well, this one does not have a beaded edge, so they cut out the same shape, but they did not put the beading on the edge because that would have been very difficult to do. Then they silver soldered the flange onto the rest of the brace, and they soldered it back together. After they did that, they buffed off the solder, but buffing off the solder also took off some of the plating, and that's why a lot of the plating is gone around this point. Of course, plating can wear off after 130 years of use. A lot of times on old instruments, the plating is gone where you touch it, like right there, and also on the other side, right there where you hold it, and also right here, because when you're holding it, your hand touches it right there. But usually the plating does not wear off on the inside of the instrument where you cannot even touch it. So I'm thinking that some of this plating, not all of it, but some came off because of buffing, and the rest came off just by wear over the years. Right here, there is some plating missing, and you'd expect that on an old instrument, because when it gets set down, it takes off a tiny little bit of the plating. Not a lot, but if it's been set down thousands of times over the years, it would take off enough just to take off a little bit of this plating. And also around the bell rim, you'd expect that plating to be gone after all these years. But overall, the plating on this instrument is in very good shape for how old it is. And I do expect to buy a spot plater, and I am going to touch up the plating on this instrument. But that will probably be several videos from now. In this video, I'm just going to fix these cracks. And I did find some cracks on these parts. This is the C-shank that goes into the C-crook. And it does fit in there, and it works okay. But there is this crack, and the crack made it down to here. And if I do not fix that, the crack will probably move down further. So I am going to fix that crack so it does not keep expanding. And then on this slide, there is a small crack just starting on the end of the tubing. If I turn this around, you can see it's a little bit deeper from the inside. And then there's also one more crack right there in the tubing. Then on the C crook, the tubing is cracked also right there. You can see that. And not only is it cracked, it also got bent a little bit. So I'm going to have to try to straighten that out and then fix the crack.
And if I turn this around, you can see that the metal does not line up either. So I'm going to have to solve all of that. To understand why these cracks happened, a long time ago, the way that they would manufacture tubing, what they would do is take a flat piece of brass and wrap it around a rod. Of course, they would not do it with their hands. They would do it with a machine. Then they would take out the rod and braze the seam, and then they would end up with a tuning slide tube. And then when it cracks, it usually cracks along where the brazing is. What I'm going to do is silver solder in this crack. For solder to stick to anything, it needs to have a clean surface. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some of my needle files. Actually, I'm going to take the smallest, pointiest one right there. And that's going to clean up inside of the crack. I'm going to file the crack so that the solder will stick to it where I'm filing because the filing takes off the old metal and the old oxidation and then it leaves clean metal behind and then the solder is going to stick to the clean metal. I'm also going to use a small piece of sandpaper to get right in between the crack. I'm not going to be able to go in too far. I did not want to spread the tubing apart farther than it already is because that can cause problems too. I am going to use silver solder which melts at a high temperature. And if you use silver solder anywhere near soft solder, like this right here, this is soft soldered on, it's going to melt the soft solder and make a big mess. So there are two options. I can either unsolder this and then do the work on this and put it back on, or there's one other thing I can do too. Here's what I have going on. I have my piece of metal to protect the bench because it will get very hot. And if anything falls, I want it to fall into the piece of metal and not my bench. Here's my solder clamp. I'm going to get these two out of the way because I only, only need one of the clips this time. I'm going to put the C shank in here. This clamp will also help keep the crack shut because if it opens up at all, then we'll have a hard time fitting into here. So anyway, I'm going to tighten this down to keep that shut. I'm not tightening it too much, but just enough to keep it shut. And then I have some water, and I'm going to fill up this all the way, right to the very top with water. Then I'm going to dip this in the water until the silver plated part and the solder part is all covered up. The water will take the heat away from the soft soldered part. The soft solder melts at around 450 degrees Fahrenheit. The other part, which I'm going to silver solder, melts at around 1250 degrees. So there's going to be a difference in about 800 degrees between here and here. Now I'm going to put some flux on it. This is the high temperature flux used for brazing and silver soldering. I'm just going to put a little bit of that in the crack. So what I'm going to do is heat this up, and it should heat up pretty quickly to temperature. I'm going to try to keep my head out of the way of the camera too. Uh, we're kind of both looking on at the same thing at the same time here. But I need to be very careful not to overheat or, uh, or do anything that would be bad. Okay, I got... There's a little bit of silver solder on there, but it has to melt in. And then I'm going to go inside of the tool. Oh! Oh, this is bending. That's not good. Okay. Well, I'm going to have to do something else here. Okay, I'm going to cool that off. What happened is I put a little too much pressure on the clamp, and it, when it heated, it softened and it, it uh, made it an oval shape. So I'm going to have to round that out again and then not put as much pressure on this time and do it again. I rounded out the tube somewhat. I am going to have to do it a little bit more after I'm done soldering. Uh, and I am leaving this in the video because I want you to know that things do happen. Nothing ever works out exactly like you want it to. Uh, you just have to know how to correct your errors as you make them. So I'm going to be correcting that error and I don't think it's going to really cause any long-term damage. So I'm just going to keep going. I want that solder... Okay, there it goes, it just melted. I want that solder to go down in the crack. This is a little bit tricky. Um, yeah, silver solder acts silver solder acts differently than 
soft solder. Uh, what I'm going to do when I'm done is I'm going to file off all of the excess silver solder because there's going to be a lot of extra silver solder on this joint. Um, this is called a butt solder joint where you put two pieces together like that and those are the hardest solder joints to do because solder just does not like to flow in between two pieces like this. Solder likes to go between two flat pieces like on flanges but it does not like to go between two pieces that are put together end to end. And that's what I'm trying to do with this solder right now. So this is going to be a fairly messy solder joint, but I am going to clean it up when I'm done. What we have going on now is the water is sucking up a lot of the heat, so on the top it's to temperature real quick, but then when you get down a little bit farther, it does not want to get up to temperature because the water is sucking the, the heat out of it. Down here it's only around room temperature, but then you get up a little bit higher and then you get up to 1200 degrees. So there's a lot of difference in temperature between here and here. So the colder metal is sucking up the heat from the hotter metal. This is actually a fairly tricky solder joint to do, but I am going to clean it up. So whatever happens, I'm going to solve the problem. I'm going to test this to see if it leaks. Put my finger over one end and blow on the other. I guess it does leak. There's a leak right there. So I'm going to have to heat that up again and put a little bit more solder there. I'm going to heat that up to temperature. And then I'm going to put just a little bit more solder right in that little crack right there. Okay, that should do it. I'm going to test it again. Okay, and that's good this time. There are no leaks. Here's my solder joint. It's not the best solder joint I've ever done. In fact, it's pretty bad, but that's because it's silver solder and it did clump up and it's a butt joint. I already talked about the reason why. But anyway, I'm going to have to file down all that excess solder before I use the file, I'm going to grind down some of the larger stuff with a grinding wheel. I have to be very careful not to go farther than the solder, though. I'm only going to take off some of the biggest clumps of solder, and then I'm going to file the rest of it. I took off the large clumps of solder. Now I need to file it down. I'm going to use this small flat file. When the grooves of the file get clogged up with the metal, I'm going to use this. This is called a file card, and you use it to clean off the file. Now I'm going to file off all of the excess solder, and I'm going to be careful to avoid touching the brass on the shank. This will probably take about 10 or 15 minutes, so I'm going to turn the camera off, and I will show you when it is complete. It's about 10 or 15 minutes later and I'm done filing down the solder. It still is a little bit rough so I'm going to smooth that off. And also the end was a little oval shaped if you remember that I uh, kind of made a little mistake there. So I rounded it off with one of my burnishing rings. So now the end is round again. I put a tapered mandrel on my vise. I'm going to hold it in place with the mandrel. I have a piece of the wicking material that I use for cleaning tuning slides. I put it in my little vise and then I rub some buffing compound on it and this is the white buffing compound and I rub it on both sides and then I use this to polish the shank. I take this and I rub it vigorously on the shank. I can tell this is going to take a while since I heated it up so hot uh, it got a lot more oxidation than it usually does, so it's going to take a little more work than it usually does to clean that up. And then I'm going to rotate it. This wicking material takes off a lot less material than if I buffed it, and that's why I'm not buffing it. Although buffing would be easier, I do not want to take off too much material. Here's the finished C shank, and that's where the crack was before. And now I just need to test it to see if it fits in here like it's supposed to. Yes, it's a little tight, but you want it a little bit tight so that it doesn't move around when you play it. So this is complete.
Now I just have the other two cracks in the tuning slides and then the one crack in the crook. But you have already seen me fix one of the cracks, so I'm not going to make you watch me do the other ones. And I think I'm going to save the crack in this tubing, which I'm going to put a patch on. I'm going to save that for the next video. I hope you enjoyed this video. Next week I'm hoping to get the dents out of the cornet and patch the crook that I just told you about. And also solder the two joints that are broken. Please subscribe for more band instrument repair videos. And look in the description below for links to related videos.